and I had a camera around my neck and the art director saw me coming with Jeff and they said, okay, you can go by. And the art director looks at me and points at me. He says, no pictures. And I went, okay, all right, cool, man. I got it. All right. So we go up in there and they're setting up for a scene where the Cowboys, um, actually the Vendetta Posse comes over a rise and they take on the Cowboys. So we sit up on a hill up there, me and Jeff, and we're watching this and feeling privileged to be able to see some behind the scenes of a Hollywood movie. And there's Val Kilmer and there's uh, Kurt Russell and Powers Booth is there. It's just fantastic. And so uh, during a break in the filming, Kevin Jar comes over and sits down and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, I have to take a picture. And so I reach down quickly and just take, I don't even look I, the lens. I just take the picture. I don't even know if I got it. And that picture now is historic because about 48 hours later, Kevin Jar was fired. He wrote the script. He was directing. And I watched them film a scene where Wyatt Earp gets off and does Queensbury rules on punching out uh, one of the cowboys. And Kurt Russell didn't like it. And he was doing kind of the Hollywood kind of a thing. And I later thought, I think that was a scene that might have got him fired. And I actually saw this. And so now... They changed the movie and the, the the line I just told you about with uh, uh, with uh, Billy Clanton is not even in the movie. In fact, I would maintain, here's a punchline for this whole talk. If, if somebody ever finds that original script and films that movie, it will be the best Wyatt Earp, Tombstone, OK Corral movie ever done. They changed it to make it commercial. It's still a classic, but Kevin Jar is the genius. And here's why. He paid off the John Ringo, Doc Holliday, doppelganger face-off. It just thematically, and if you're a storyteller, you know they have to meet. You have to have a showdown with them at the ending. And so just prior to our talk here today, I went and uh, uh, Googled uh, that showdown, and it's just full of fantastic lines. I mean, it's just, you know, all right, Lunger, let's get it on. Oh, uh, well, I think, uh, Johnny, I think, I've, I mean, anyway, I won't bore you with the lines. You probably know them better than I do. But anyway, I believe that that's where it really started to sink in that uh, people wanted uh, Doc Holliday to kill uh, Johnny Ringo. It's just uh, thematically, we want that to happen. So let's go back to the actual history and find out if any of that is true, Okay. Uh, on uh, July 18, 1882, the Tombstone Epitaph published a shocking story that the body of Johnny Ringo had been found in a, a cluster of blackjack oaks near Morris Canyon up in the Chiricahuas, not far from Galeyville, which is the Cowboys headquarters. And a woodcutter named John Yost was uh, hauling wood and he had a dog with him and the dog was running by the wagon and the uh, dog... Uh, went over to the clump of uh, trees and was sniffing at something. He couldn't see it. Yost couldn't see it. And so he uh, stopped his wagon and the dog started barking. You know, as you ever seen a dog around, you know, dead rattlesnake or something, they get, they get real weird about that. And so uh, Yost runs over there and sees that uh, there's John Ringo under the tree, uh, sitting, sitting in the cluster of the trees with a bullet hole in his head. So then, uh, the coroner's report comes out and there's all these weird things that are attendant to how he was found. Uh, one of them that is that he uh, had taken off his uh, boots or lost his boots and he had taken his undershirt and cut it and wrapped it around his feet to make uh, makeshift moccasins and he'd evidently been walking. And the theory started that he uh, was dying of thirst. He lost his horse and he shot himself in the head. That was, that was one of the theories. Well, uh, that theory shot down when you know that there's uh, water 200 feet from where, <laughs> from where he was found. So that, that doesn't really hold water, literally. And then uh, there was other uh, mysteries. Uh, there was a, uh, a lock of his scalp missing. And later when Wyatt Earp tried to take credit and claimed that he um, uh, waylaid uh, Ringo and it was a, a big gunfight uh, there at the spring, um, the, somebody went and cut his hair just to kind of humiliate him. Uh, but uh, who's to say that uh, Yost himself didn't go, wow, that's Johnny Ringo, and he didn't cut it. We, we don't know. So it's one of the, one of the mysteries. It's, it's why people believe all the different uh, conspiracy theories about who actually uh, shot 
John Ringo. We should probably back up for those of you who maybe are not as familiar as I am and my 12 crazy friends I'm talking about are about the story because uh, as you may know, uh, Doc Holliday, um, uh, I, I told my friends, uh, I was at a, a, a trade show in Los Angeles and they said, what is the lesson of the OK Corral fight? And I said, never take a drunk dentist to make a misdemeanor arrest. Uh, and uh, Klum, who was the mayor of Tombstone at the time, said that he always regretted or felt uh, regretted that uh, Virgil Earp had made that decision to take Wyatt, uh, take Doc Holliday with him and gave him the shotgun. Many people believe I'm one of them, that it was Doc who saw that they were waiting in his side yard where he was staying at Fly's boarding house and that he made the lunging move with, with the shotgun threatening and in the testimony, Virgil Earp says, hold on, I didn't mean that. And what he was really doing was talking to Doc Holliday, like, cool it, you're going you're gonna to get us all killed. And he almost did. Um, so there's that story. And then another story that I just, uh, people don't do, it's not, in fact, it's not in the movie Tombstone, is that after the fight and the deaths, the recriminations start happening. And uh, McClowry's uh, brother comes in from, Texas, and he's going to get them. He allegedly offered $500 for any of the herbs to be killed. And there's a showdown on Allen Street between Doc Holliday and John Ringo for OK Corral 2. And it had just rained, and the water spouts are spraying uh, water on there. I really wanted to do that painting because I could just about smell it. It was so incredible in my mind. And a lowly policeman named Flynn, John Flynn, I think his name, he came up and bear hugged um, John Ringo and then arrested Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp. He averted OK2, and he's lost to history. What's with that? Why is it history ever paid that off? OK, uh, so back to uh, Ringo. So uh, Billy Breckenridge meets uh, John Ringo in South Pass, which is about 12 miles east of um, Tombstone on the way to uh, Gaileyville, which is probably where Ringo was going. And Breckenridge reports in his book, Hell Dorado, that uh, Ringo was so drunk and had been on a bender for several days. And he'd made these like really weird comments that he didn't think he would had long to run. Somebody might do him in. Uh, he was very uh, morose and he offered some whiskey to uh, Breckenridge and Breckenridge said it was so hot I couldn't drink it. So that really kind of gives you, you know, we're we're in the middle of the summer in Tombstone where it's not very cool. And uh, Breckenridge declines, and that's the last anybody saw him alive until uh, his body was found. So uh, late in life, as I said, um, White Earp tried to take credit uh, for for take waylaying him, and you can see uh, Earp had the motive because. He, he hated these guys. These guys killed his, his brother, almost killed another brother. And so, uh, and, and Earp was trying to cash in on his name uh, at the end there. He was in Hollywood. And so he, he, for whatever reason, he claimed that he, he waylaid um, uh, Johnny Ringo and did him in. Uh, the biggest evidence to my mind uh, against Doc Holliday uh, coming back from Colorado to kill him is that uh, Holliday was in court in Pueblo, Colorado, I think it was on, on July 11th, and uh, and 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 Ringo's body's found on the 13th, and then um, uh, Holiday's in court on the 14th. Now, an interesting thing. This is an interesting insight for you about history and the the world I play in. Uh, about 20 years ago, I think it was, I did a session at Shefflin Hall in Tombstone on this very subject, and I got up in the morning. And I gave my presentation and talk, and I said, there's no way Doc Holliday came back from Colorado and got Johnny Ringo unless he had a really fast horse. Yeah, yeah. And got there and come in. Everybody's nodding, and I'm thinking, well, I made my point. Uh, nobody's going to uh, be contentious about this ever again. This is I've, I've, I've told the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Well, in the afternoon, another author uh, – who I will not name because uh, we, we do not agree on anything, and he's dead, uh, is, uh, came up and, and told the exact opposite story and said that Doc Holliday could have filed a nolo contendere, some legal term, uh, to fake out the officials in Colorado and that 
him and Wyatt Earp did come back, and the proof of it is that Wyatt Earp said he did, and so he obviously killed him. And now the here's the irony to the whole thing. I'm looking around the room, and the same people who were nodding at my talk are nodding to this. And I went, well, I didn't convince anyone, and what do people want to believe? And the, uh, well, if you're alive in this time uh, that we're living through right now, people believe any damn thing they want to believe. They don't, they don't need facts. They don't need anything. They just believe it. So that was a rude awakening for me. And I know that a lot of you are probably um, listening to this and going, well, what does he know? And uh, <laughs> you would have a, you'd have a case there. I can't, I can't argue with that. Uh, but I, my point is the evidence is overwhelming um, th that uh, John Ringo did uh, commit suicide. It doesn't make a good story and uh, as good a story as the one that Kevin Jar wrote. And of course, um, uh, we just want to believe that he, in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, was done in by those guys. That's just the way that that kind of thing goes. So um, expanding out on that, Doc Holliday, um, um, I, what I love is the, uh, I like good maps, okay? And uh, in so many books that you're reading, and you're reading uh, Stuart Lake's Wyatt Earp, and you're reading, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tombstone by Walter Noble Burns, and the names, they say, uh, the Vendetta Posse went to Fairbank, where they picked up some uh, money. They went to Eureka Springs. They went to Hooker's Ranch. They went to Cottonwood Springs. They went to Mescal Springs. They went back to Charleston. They went to South Pass and waylaid Florentino Cruz. Then they ended up at the uh, Fort, uh, they ended up at uh, Fort uh, Grant, and they were denied uh, protection, yada, yada, yada. And so then they went the back way to uh, Silver City. They sold their horses. They went to Deming. They caught the train there. They went to Albuquerque. They spent two weeks in Albuquerque. And Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday got in a spat, uh, allegedly because Doc Holliday called Wyatt Earp a Jew boy for dating a Jewish woman. That would be Sarah. Uh, that would be Sadie Marcus, who uh, late in life uh, insisted that everybody call her Josephine. Uh, uh, Marcus, and when uh, her, all of her professional life, she went by Sadie, which is a uh, a wild woman's name, and she didn't want that. So anyway, then the um, Doc Holiday and the Earps uh, take separate trains to go, and Arizona to come and get them back. And so uh, they send Bob Paul, who's the sheriff of Pima County, up to extradite them and bring them back for the charge of murder for killing Frank Stilwell in the train station at Tucson when the Earps, Wyatt was uh, delivering the body, uh, actually escorting uh, the body and Virgil was wounded and they were in the, tombs, uh, the Tucson train station and he saw Frank Stilwell, he chased him down, gave him both barrels of his shotgun and then all the other Vendetta guys, Doc Holliday included, stepped up and added their two cents. In the morning, Bob Paul uh, commented to the press that Frank Stilwell was the most shot up body he'd ever witnessed in his life. And so Doc Holliday bangs around Colorado. Uh, well, the, uh, first of all, uh, Pat Masterson goes to the governor of Colorado, said, hey, you're a good Republican. Uh, you can't let these, uh, these guys uh, uh, bring him back. It's, it, it, they'll just be lynched when they get back. And so uh, the governor of Colorado denies uh, the extradition. And so they get off the hook. Earp is in Gunnison. Um, Doc is banging around Pueblo. He's, he goes to the state fair. He's arrested by a, uh, a guy that's a dime store, you know, detective kind of thing. And he uh, is in Leadville. He gets in another shooting scrape. Um, he ends up in um, Glenwood Springs and uh, he's emaciated. And the last place he needed to go was to the hot springs in Glenwood Springs because it uh, exacerbated his lungs. He was suffering from TB. And so uh, my favorite story of that whole thing is that he's in bed. I think this comes from Walter Noble Burns. He's in bed and uh, he looks down and he's about to expire and he sees that his uh, feet are without boots on because everybody said he was going to die with his boots on. And he allegedly says his last words, this is funny. I love that line. And it turns out I was talking to Gary Roberts, who is the foremost Doc Holliday expert on the planet, in my estimation. 
And Gary said, well, that was one problem with that line is that uh, he was unconscious for the last uh, hour's life. So there's another thing that you just, you know, you have these lines, you love them. I'm your Huckleberry, whatever. Um, and, uh, and it's not, and it's not true. So Doc cashes out the, the and the, here's another one. Okay. So it's winter time and uh, the hearse can't make it up the hill to where the cemetery is in Glenwood Springs. And so uh, Doc Holliday's buried at the foot of the, of the, uh, the butte. And then uh, people forget about it and uh, Glenwood Springs grows out that way. And he's never taken to the top uh, where his, his gravestone is. And he's in someone's backyard. Well, I love that story. And it was told to me by uh, the mayor, I believe, of Glenwood Springs when I visited there. And um, later I found out that that's probably apocryphal. It's probably one of those great stories. Uh, I, as you notice, I'm still telling it, but I do give the caveat that it, uh, other people don't believe that. And so that's what uh, has driven me all these years. And I wanted to say, I want to give a plug out right here. As I said, it's very confusing where they are. And so I thought if I ever do a book, uh, books on the Old West characters, I'm going to have good maps. And so I went to the best map maker in Arizona who was working at the Arizona Republic. His name was Gus Walker. And I hired him away from the Arizona Republic by promising him he could play his guitar at lunch and we'd all listen. I'm not, I'm not making that up. That's a true story. And so Gus Walker, we called him the Mappinator. He was the best map maker. Fabulous. He's since passed. Uh, we miss him so. And the Mappinator did the maps for my uh, Doc Holiday book. Here's just a, a sweet little example of, um, get the right page here. Here's just a sweet example. I was giving you all those uh, locations on the, the, the uh, Vendetta ride. Every one of them is marked. What date they're there. Uh, where did they go from there? They went to here. And I just love that. I, I haven't seen it in any other books uh, because I'm a map nut. I, I want to know where they are. I hate that when you're reading the story and it says, uh, you know, they rode over the hill and they were in uh, Cong Congress Junction. You're going, well, where is that? I, well, in relation to what? And so that's what I've done is to try to uh, do that. That's about all the uh, remarks I wanted to make. Let's get to the questions. Um, William Francis uh, wants to know how much of the movie Tombstone was left on the cutting room floor. And do you think there would ever be an extended edition director's cut if there were? Well, there is an extended uh, version of, of the movie. Uh, several scenes have been reinstated. Uh, but I got to tell you, that original script, which was deemed by the producers as being too dark, uh, which is what I loved about it because it showed the herbs as shades of gray. Um, some have compared it to uh, The Godfather. It had a very dark uh, feel to it because it, it dealt with a lot of the, um, uh, it dealt with the uh, the herbs dark side. And so the producers fired Kevin Jar and they changed it into, uh, you know, the, the Vendetta Rise. They're shooting guys off the back of horses and stuff like that. Not quite like that in the, um, uh, original script. My hope is that someone will take his original script and do it. They could do it as a, a mini series. It'd be perfect now for streaming uh, and really go back and use his actual script. Don't, don't monkey with it. It is poetry. Uh, Kevin never recovered. Um, he uh, passed away. Oh, it's been, it's been a decade at least now, but I was so thrilled and honored that I got to meet him on the set of the movie that he created. And someday, William Francis, I hope somebody takes that and really films it right. Um, I thought only his lawyer was in court that day. Elizabeth Doolittle. Uh, well, that is prob that's probably, and, and you got me on that, that's probably how the person who was uh, arguing against me in Tombstone uh, it may have been that the, the, the lawyer was there. Uh, and so that's what makes these fun is uh, that there's a little wrinkle that um, I didn't know. Uh, and, it, and it makes this interesting because uh, you and I, uh, Elizabeth Doolittle, could have a beer at the Crystal Palace and we could argue to the cows come home on this. And that's what I love. I love that. It doesn't get any better than that. When we were in the Crystal Palace and those guys. And by the way, if you didn't recognize all of those names, those are all the heavyweights. Uh, Alan Barra, Casey Tiefer Tiller, 
uh, you know, John Bosnecker, who's just won a great uh, new book on, on the Herb Saga. Uh, was Ringo really a psychopathic, as everyone uh, eludes? Nancy Ivansko Hitch, Hitchner? A great question. Um, you know, um, a book was written about 20 years ago on the gunfighter that wasn't, basically. And it was that uh, uh, Ringo uh, really hadn't uh, uh, shot that many people, wasn't, wasn't that uh, crazy. But it, it, what is true is that he uh, was educated and it took Kevin Jar's genius to take two educated men on the opposite sides, Doc Holliday, John Peters Ringo, put them together and make a showdown and have them trade Latin. That was totally Kevin Jar and have him do gun tricks and then have Val Kilmer do it with uh, uh, a cup, which, by the way, he put lead in the cup to be able to do that. That's genius. And to me, um, you need the right person to tell a story. In fact, it, it makes it, you, Wyatt Earp could not tell his story. He tried, and his wife tried, and they had John Flood write all these florid. I mean, it's unreadable. And um, they were friends with uh, Tom Mix. And uh, William S. Hart, and uh, uh, evidently, I'm guessing, um, William S. Hart said, it's got to have pep. It's got to be positive, uh, you know, all those kind of things. And so when John Flood would, uh, and Wyatt would start to write some of the darker aspects of the story, she would come in, in their kitchen, and say, no, 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 it's got to be clean. And she didn't want anybody getting close to her story. And she goes, it's got to have pep. Well, it took Walter Noble Burns to come, who had already reinvented Billy the Kid, and now he's looking for somebody else. And he came to L.A., looked up Wyatt Earp, and Wyatt Earp said, I've already got a writer. And so uh, Burns said, uh, well, what about Doc Holliday? You knew Doc Holliday. I'm going to write about him. And he interviewed him that way. And then um, uh, Walter Noble Burns comes out, uh, Tombstone. And uh, Wyatt Earp has a chapter that begins the Lion of Tombstone. And Earp felt totally uh, screwed over by Walter Noble Burns. Uh, however, uh, it took Burns to tell the story right. It's not easy telling these stories. You know, a lot, a lot of my friends say, well, just tell the story the way it happened. Yeah, it's not interesting. Okay. All right. <laughs> he didn't come back. His lawyer was alone. End of story. That's not an interesting story. You got to have an imagination. And uh, somebody said, historians will tell you what happened. Novelists will tell you how it felt. And movies put us there with them. And the stakes better be high. And so then, you know, there's an old Texas saying, if you can't approve upon a story, you have no business retelling it in the first place. Uh, what's your thoughts on John Yost, who found a Ringo uh, as the actual killer, Tom Betts? Excellent question. Um, I'd love to talk to him. Uh, if you've ever been up there, I went up to the ranch and actually, uh, uh, stood there and been out to the, uh, Blackjack Oaks, which are still there. In fact, there's a picture I ran it in my Wyatt Earp book of Billy Breckenridge sitting on the throne where, where Ringo was found. And there appears to be a ghost over his head. It's the most uncanny picture. And those are the kind of little connections that, that I love. And I would love to talk to uh, John Yostor. Well, here's another myth, okay? Um, so I was gonna say, it'd be, it'd be great to talk to John Yost relatives, but here's the secret to that, okay? The family knows the least, okay? I always use the example of, Okay, imagine your father sitting you down and going, you know, we had these gals and we were out in this car and the car got high centered and I had a fifth of Jim Beam. Somebody tried to shoot it. They're not going to tell you. <laughs> your dad's not going to tell you that story. Okay, I'm not going to tell my kids that story. And that was a real story that happened in my life. I'm not going to tell that to my kids. So when people say, I talk to the family, I, I always do. I don't say anything because it's rude. But I, I think to myself, well, you got the BS version, usually, okay? Um, anyway, that's it. Uh, it's been great talking to you guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you really want a, a good read, check out The Illustrated Life and Times of Doc Holliday. The maps are fantastic. Yeah, buy it for the maps and go read someone else's book. Like, like a, go read Gary Roberts' book, Use My Maps. You'll be glad you did. Thank you.